Uh, Evan uh, is talking about resilient infrastructure with Surf. He's an operations engineer at PagerDuty, and he's going to tell us how they perform infrastructure or or ah, orchestration using Surf. Uh, please help me welcome Evan to the stage. Thank you, Chris. Um, as he mentioned, yeah, my name is Evan Gilman. We're here to talk about how PagerDuty uses Surf for all sorts of orchestration things. I hope you're excited as I am trying to get there. So, yeah, I'm Evan Gilman. Again, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about myself before we start here. Um, I worked at the University of Miami many, many moons ago, probably about the same time this picture was taken, in fact. Um, currently, we're doing operations engineering at PagerDuty. Been there for about two and a half years now. It's a lot of fun, seen a lot of growth, and doing pretty much everything that you would expect a PagerDuty operations guy to be doing, and then some more. So I also want to kind of say that this whole talk is structured on the shoulders of giants. Lots and lots and lots of engineers um, have come together to write this software that we're going to talk about today. And I have to say that you know, you know, those things have to be attributed to those people. Um, coworkers of mine, of course, HashiCorp as well. Um, so a lot of thanks to those people before we start. Well, here's just a little um, outline of what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to talk about what PageRuty really needed in this whole fiasco, um, why we chose Surf to begin with, how we bent Surf to our will and made it do the things that we wanted it to do, and some of the use cases, some of the, some of the things that we've actually implemented uh, uh, using the tooling and stuff that we've developed around Surf. But I think that before we start, it's probably important to just understand what PagerDuty does. Um, so uh, how many of you have ever heard of PagerDuty? Okay. So pretty much everyone. <laughs> so I'll skip all of the alerting and escalation nonsense, and uh, we'll go kind of straight into the, the uh, presentation. Probably everyone's looking forward to that. So without further ado, uh, what did we need? What does PagerDuty need? What what are the problems we're trying to solve with this stuff here? Well, like I said, I've been here for you know, a few years now, and I've seen us grow a lot. We've grown probably 10x in terms of people, infrastructure requests, all the metrics. Um, so I've seen a lot, and um, I've seen a lot of time, and I've seen a lot of growth. And in that time and growth, we've kind of cropped up a lot of these maintenance tasks that need to be kind of done on our infrastructure. Um, of course, every one of these tasks has to be coordinated in some way, shape, or form. Our Cassandra repairs have to be sequential, you know. The uh, firewall uh, port configuration has to happen before the deploy, but after the security tooling. Um, and then, of course, there's like chef run coordination across clusters and dances and things that have to happen in order to make shit happen the way that you want it to happen. Um, so we have all these problems. I think most people have these problems, right? Um, we solved a lot of these problems originally uh, with cron. But you know, there's a lot of requirements in the timing and execution of these runs. And it can get really, really messy and really, really hard to maintain after a while with cron only. And to kind of give you an idea of that, uh, you end up code like this. This is a helper code. This is a helper function that we had in Chef uh, that basically takes Cassandra nodes and then assigns them minutes to run things based on how many nodes are in the ring, such that it's all spaced out properly, and all this nonsense. So, so it's a lot of work. And I, I please try to read this code. <laughs> it's not easy. And things that couldn't be done in S in uh, cron were done with SSH. Um, and SSH is a great command dispatch tool, though it is usually susceptible to network anomalies. Error detection and recovery during orchestration is really hard. Um, you go and you do this thing over here, you go and you do this thing over here, what state is it in? I don't know. My SSH connection just failed out. That command timed out. Did it succeed? Did it fail? What state is it in now? Do I need to clean up? 
There's lots of edge cases and recovery scenarios and all kinds of nastiness that comes into play um, when the SSH connection times out or otherwise errors out. So we're not really super fond of the SSH solution. I have this thing, I forgot. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so what we're really looking for is just a general purpose orchestration framework. It's got to be open source, whatever it is. Has to be lightweight, has to be easy to deploy. It also has to be resilient against network failures. And that, for PagerDuty, is a really, really big deal. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that point there. So PagerDuty is striped across data centers across the WAN. We have three data centers. We have commodity internet in between those data centers. And lo and behold, commodity internet is just as unreliable as you might think it would be. We've got really, really weird and exciting failure modes going on between these things. And uh, the worst of which I think is what we call the single route anomaly. And it's, so it's not uncommon for us in this topology to lose connectivity on a single leg of our infrastructure. Because it's caused obvious problems. You know, host and, and data center A can no longer talk to host and data center B. And an orchestration job that might be running in data center A will subsequently also not be able to talk to a node in data center B. That job is probably gonna fail under this failure scenario. So, these things last for a really long time, like a lot longer than you might think, in fact. And I've got proof and examples here. This is a graph of our inter-DC round trip time in milliseconds over the last, oh, this was like a week and a half ago, I guess. On February 18th, it started. You can see this anomaly lasted nearly two days. February 18th to, or sorry, uh, Friday the 18th to September the 20th. This anomaly kind of manifested itself in elevated latencies, uh, elevated packet loss. Sometimes you just completely couldn't reach it for periods of time. And it happens for a long time. And so this is kind of what I'm trying to drive home. This is, this is between only two data centers, US West 1 and US West 2, in fact, in Amazon. Um, and during this period of time, we had lots of connection failures. We had other kinds of things timing out, erroring out. So this is, a, this is a real thing that, th that happens. And so, you know, we got this cron problem, we wanna get rid of cron. We wanna centralize this stuff, we wanna orchestrate it. But it has to be HA. It has to be multi-data center because you have problems like this. And at the end of the day, task execution should never bring down your resiliency profile. It's very, very important. This is actually a quote from one of my coworkers, very smart guy. And, um, <clears throat> I completely believe in this, you know, because really, you're not gonna put in something that is less resilient than it was before, right? Maybe it's more manageable, but hey, like resiliency is key here. You can't replace what always works with something that sometimes works. So that kind of leads us into the big question, why surf, if you haven't understood already? Surf's very important in solving this problem. So really, I mean, if you take a step back, we're really kind of just looking for general purpose orchestration, you know? There's lots of existing options for general purpose orchestration. This is not an unsolved problem. We've got Ansible, we've got mCollective, we've got Pushy, we've got Fabric, we've got loads of other tools. And all of these tools are great, you know, and we use several of them, in fact. Um, but none of them kind of 100% solve our use case for this particular issue. More importantly, none of them can handle the reachability problems. Um, most likely case in that, and the case in that, is really just rooted in the protocols it uses for command dispatch. None of these solutions use a command dispatch protocol that is resilient to these problems. Luckily for us, we're familiar with a protocol that is resilient. That's Surf. Surf's not affected by any of these problems. Mostly because it uses gossip. Gossip is infectious, works around these really weird network issues that we tend to see in our infrastructure. Um, under Surf, gossip is used for message passing only. 
Um, so just getting a message from one node to another node uh, traverses the gossip network, which is cool because it means we can route around these weird failures and other things. But there's also membership issues, right? Like how do you know that a, a, a neighbor is alive or dead if you can't directly reach it? So Surf has implemented a, a paper called SWIM for that, SWIM for membership. Uh, SWIM, SWIM is published by Cornell, actually. Um, and the, the Surf implementation, I believe, is called Member List. But it uh, uses a, a Surf for, for member state information and also failure detection. So um, how do we know if a node has failed or not? Is it just reachable on, an, on only one set of hosts or another set of hosts? Um, SWIM handles all this stuff for us. So inside SWIM, well, there are two failure detection uh, mechanisms, if you will. There's probing and there's suspicion. Right. So there are, inside that, there are two different types of probing. There's called a direct probe and an indirect probe. A direct probe is very simple. Direct probe is a single node tries a random set of other nodes for reachability. Does it succeed or does it pass? So in our failure mode, this check might succeed, where the, the opaque circle is the one that is performing the checks. But this check might fail. Right? So when this random check fails, it triggers the next phase of failure detection, which is called the indirect probe. Right? And the indirect probe asks other nodes to help, basically. Um, the, the other nodes that are asked are randomly chosen, and the number of nodes that are asked are, is configurable. So we selected uh, more nodes, they'll check, one of them succeeds, and the member remains in surf, which is great, that's what we want, right? That's the behavior. But what if we were unlucky? What if the random nodes that were chosen were all in the same data center with a reachability issue? Well then, it fails, the indirect probe. And when the indirect probe fails, we move to the next phase. We move to the suspicion phase. At that point in time, that node which is not able to be reached is marked as suspicious. And that means that a surf event is injected, says this node is now marked as suspicious. If you don't hear from it, it's gone. That node, because of gossip and all its magic, will receive this suspicion event and will say, hey, I'm, not, I'm here still. You know? It has the ability to veto this thing. So it vetoes, it nullifies the suspicion, everything gets reset, the eviction's no more, and it's great. So this is kind of the way that the member list stuff avoids uh, eviction of nodes which have kind of asymmetric um, you know, network qualities, if you will. It's very robust, it works very well. We found to drastically reduce false positives in these kinds of failure scenarios, and as complex as this all seems, it's all abstracted away from us. And the reality of this thing is that SURF is actually pretty easy to use. Um, it's easily deployed. It's easily extensible. RPC and event handlers come together to kind of give us the building blocks for whatever we want to do on top of SURF. SURF becomes just messaging. And you can see that with these qualities, SURF can act very effectively uh, as a resilient command dispatch system. And that's how we've chosen to use it. So how? How have we, how have we done all this stuff? You know, we, okay, we have command dispatch. How, how do we tie all this stuff together? Well, obvious, there's obvious stuff, right? We have event handlers that maintain various tasks for us. Um, we tag. Uh, chef roles onto the agents, we tag hosting providers, we tag environments, we tag lots of metadata onto uh, each surf agent that participates in this cluster. And using those tags, uh, we can leverage queries to filter those hosts out. You know? We can receive acknowledgement and replies from those hosts as well. So we can say, what's the load in this data center kind of thing. You know? So we got all this stuff, that's pretty cool. We think it's pretty good idea, we think that it can dispatch commands pretty reliably, we think that it's a good starting point, but PagerDuty operations is a Ruby shop and there's no Ruby library. Oh man, certainly not going to be shelling out and doing all this nonsense. So we wrote the Ruby library. We wrote SurfX. SurfX is open source, there'll be a link at the end. 
Um, it's a native Ruby client for Surf. It uses RPC to attach to the locally running Surf daemon and supports both events and queries. It's really, really cool. It comes with um, a few event handler helpers as well to aid you in the writing of handlers in Ruby. One of those handlers, uh, one of those handler helpers, I should say, is async job. Async job provides us job management over surf. Because a surf handler has to exit quickly and needs to give a response code quickly, um, async job will fork off. Well, it does a double fork and will maintain a supervisory process and your child process as well. And it does this in order to support long running jobs over surf. Right? And uh, one of the things that you get out of this kind of pattern is pulling, reaping, killing, all of the regular job management stuff that you're used to. When you take a step back after all that, you realize, well, we kind of really only built command dispatch and job management. There's a lot of other missing pieces here. Uh, we still need a place where we actually define these jobs. We still need a place where we give the concurrency, the ordering, all of this stuff. Right? But we still really kind of, in fact, need the orchestration engine, if you will. So we wrote a tool called Blender. And yes, Blender was named after the Will It Blend series from Blendtec, fortunately or unfortunately. Blender exposes a very nice Ruby DSL. Um, it allows you to declare the task, concurrency, on which member list, on which host these tasks run, so on and so forth. If you ever use Chef, the DSL is very similar to Chef, probably because the author was a Chef maintainer, but you know, uh, it's easy to use, put it that way. And uh, Blender ships with pluggable discovery drivers, which is awesome means that the list of hosts on which you want to execute tasks can be populated by a chef search, by a surf query, by pretty much anything you want, really. It's pluggable. Also ships with pluggable execution drivers, which was kind of like the main point of surf. Um, currently, tasks can be executed over SSH, or sorry, Blender, the main point of Blender. Currently, tasks can be executed over SSH, surf, or Ruby. Um, but because they're pluggable, you can kind of write whatever transport and execution driver you please, and you can ship that as a gem, which I think is really awesome. So if you have some other protocol you wish to dispatch jobs with and do job control over, it's very, very simple to extend Blender and add this as one of the execution drivers. We typically prefer Surf um, because Simply, it goes around this network funniness that we tend to see pretty often. Um, one of the main uh, uh, Blender features, in my opinion, is the ability to mix and match execution drivers. And I'd like to give you an example of that really quickly, if you don't mind. Some code. Um, this is a very small Blender script, which will first provision five Zookeeper hosts, and then perform a rolling restart of that Zookeeper cluster using surf. And you can see that the first uh, task is executed using Ruby, and the second task is executed using surf. So now that we've got the stuff all kind of tied up and ready to go, you know, we can use all this stuff together. Um, I wanted to kind of just go over what we've been using it for, really. There was one, there, there's one case, there's several cases that are quite prominent, really, but uh, the first case we'll talk about today, there are chef runs, you know? I think this is a pretty common case, to be honest, that people want to trigger chef runs with surf events. Um, our chef runs are a little more janky than most, I believe. Um, our chef runs tend to be really, really polluted with external calls. These are calls like, you know, they're typically API calls. They're usually things like, oh, register my DNS record, right? Um, go check my DNS record. Is it still accurate, if not update it, you know, in the typical chef item potence way. Um, so DNS and, and a whole bunch of other APIs, we have calls coming out of our chef runs towards. I think the biggest problem with this pattern that we've somehow adopted uh, is that these resources are pretty constrained. 
like you get throttled on these things. You get four X level responses constantly, which will fail a chef run, you know? Um, if too many hit at the same time, you risk failure, you might even risk tar pitting, right? Um, they take longer and longer as more and more of your clients hit the same endpoint and they slow down the runs. And so there's all these problems, right? And so what you really kind of want to try and do is spread the chef runs out as evenly as possible, you know? And <clears throat> the cron hacks, they, they, they work for a while, you know, depending on the number of nodes you have and your tolerances and things. Um, so what we had done for a while was kind of interesting. We, we would, it all has to be idempotent, right? So we would take the last octet of the IP address and we would distill that down to a number between zero and 60 or 59, I guess. And uh, that would be the minute on which a chef client ran on any given hour for that node, right? Okay, there you go. Poor man, poor man cron spreading hack, right? Turns out that <laughs> node alloc or, uh, sorry, IP address allocation is not exactly as even as you thought it might be. <laughs> And so you end up with a bunch of nodes lumped in one side of the hour, another side of the hour, and you end up back right back in the same place as you were when you tried to solve this freaking problem to begin with. So it becomes abundantly clear that whatever we do, we got to do, we got to be able to control the concurrency, we got to be able to control display because these things are killing us. So yeah, we'll, we'll do this pattern. Let's see. We uh, use job management with async job. So we'll chef client run will fork off of the handler using the async job uh, helper. The runs are non-blocking in Blender. So Blender will fire the run and we'll forget about it, well, which is cool because it means that Blender doesn't have to worry about your acquisition engine, doesn't have to worry about polling the status of that client run or anything like that. And uh, for protection, we do kind of like a kill and reap function before the run. So using async job again, we'll issue kill and reap queries in order to make sure that things aren't piling up, all those edge cases are taken care of for us. So Blender emits these queries uh, to a subset of the infrastructure in waves. So we'll take like, you know, 10 hosts at a time or what have you, and we'll run those, we'll wait some time, we'll run another 10, wait some time, run another 10 kind of thing. And the concurrency is kind of controlled indirectly by adjusting the size of those waves. Right. Now, certainly, um, the, the, the length of the run, the duration of the run, comes into question in determining concurrency. But for, for our purposes and uses, this, this gets us pretty much there in terms of like, what we need to figure out and the control that we're requiring. And the way that we measure success, because obviously it's not just like, let me just, if you're firing it and not checking that they're successful, you're back to cron again. So, we do check success, actually. We, we measure it indirectly uh, for Chef. When the Chef client run finishes, uh, an updated timestamp is posted to the Chef server. That only happens when the run is successful. So the Blender script, because it's Ruby, you can do anything you want. It sits and it pulls the Chef server via the API and watches for these updated timestamps. It has a list of hosts on which it triggered the Chef run. If one of those timestamps doesn't get updated, it has facilities by which it can alert and say, these hosts did not converge properly. I think actually uh, we're doing that over Slack right now, Slack alert. But um, we've been doing this for about a year now, and uh, it, it's been pretty successful. We, it solved all the problems we tried to solve and, and regressed none. But also, I, I kind of just want to give you a little taste. This, this is what the async job stuff looks like. It's really, really easy to use. So, so the, the, the top bit here, this job equals, is the async job handler, uh, uh, helper, sorry. And then the bottom bit is the regular handler helper stuff, which gives you a DSL by which you can write these handlers uh, quite easily in Ruby, of course. So this is the uh, handler to fork off our chef client run. You can see there's no fork process management, anything in here. Handlers abstract it all away for you. It's very nice. Next thing we wanted to automate was our Cassandra stuff. So we have some Cassandra requirements like probably a lot of you do. Ours, on the other hand, have to repair one node slash range at a time, which means we gotta go one at a time sequentially. None of them can overlap, which is a real problem for us. 
And then we can go away, and this is a whole other talk, but it's basically due to the way that we use Cassandra that these, these are, are there, these requirements. Um, but Cron, after a while, you saw some of the snippet from before. This is really, really hard stuff to do. It becomes very unmanageable. Um, I shouldn't say hard. It becomes unmanageable, and it becomes untenable. These, these things can overlap. So the runtime of these repairs has to be considered when you calculate how you space these crons out, right? They can't, so you can't just let run, like, like if the data volume grows overnight because some customer was bad, and then the cron fires as regular in the morning and now you've got two repairs running, right? That's not good for us. Um, in addition, the, the repairs can sometimes hang and not return and they'll just get stuck somewhere and now they can pile up. So there's a lot of really nasty stuff uh, going on here that is really hard to control just using crons alone. So what do we do? We'll use a blender, we'll use surf. We do discovery with surf. Uh, we discover using a chef role environment. That's how we know which Cassandra uh, hosts are the ones that we're trying to belong to the ring. We're trying to repair at this time, right? And then we also use Blender to pull for job status. So we'll block in Blender in the orchestration framework until we receive a success uh, feedback from async job. Say this job is finished, here's the exit code. Right? Then we can raise that exit code as, as required. You know. uh, and using this pattern, all the crown stuff's gone, is, which is great. So we've literally had outages due to repair mismanagement in Cassandra. Um, this tech allows us we haven't had one since we put this tech in, let's put it that way. So it's really, really, really nice to have. So looking into the future, kind of figure out, you know, exactly what we want to use this thing for here. There's lots of options. Um, we thought, well, it would be really nice if we could move Surf closer in Bootstrap, right? Um, because we have Blender as multi-driver uh, and all this stuff, um, we typically, lean on SSH for cloud-neutral bootstrap, things like that, right? Um, so it's nice to, to move it closer. Network is a good place for us to start and trying to move it down that pipeline. Oh, sorry. Um, so the PageDuty network resembles kind of full mesh. We drop peer-to-peer -peer policies on every host. And every host is aware of every other host it needs to talk to and has got pre-shared keys and has got this and has got that in order to facilitate those communications. So all immediate host dependencies have to be updated anytime something changes. This is probably the main drawback of this approach is that a host comes, a host goes. <coughs> Sorry. Host comes, host goes, host changes IP addresses. This happens a lot. Um, anytime that happens, all of the dependencies surrounding it have to be updated. Firewall uh, rules, all this stuff, right? And currently, we're doing all this stuff inside Chef. Uh, we have big fat libraries and all this crazy logic in Chef that calculates all these things and drops files on disk. Um, but you know, we recognize this is a problem. We have to run Chef everywhere to converge things. So you have to update all this crap. It's a real pain. So we're extracting all of that logic into Go binaries at the moment. That's the current effort, at least. So we think, you know, our host provisioning is Blender driven. We could potentially write a handler that will subscribe to various roles on which that particular host depends on, you know. Oh. And after the security tooling has been installed, but before the deploy has happened, do you want to open those firewall rules? And Blender can do that maybe simply by injecting a surf event that says, you know, this new node is here, here's the role, that's it. And in this way, we can move surf closer closer down that pipeline and uh, use it for provision or orchestration as well, which is not something that you see very commonly, at least in my opinion. So it's really important that you take a step back and understand kind of what all of this got us at the end of the day. Um, you know, it, it got us luck. It was a lot of work, but I think, I think that we came out with a good, a good deal of stuff. We got an open source library in Ruby for Surf. Never existed before. 
Um, not only that, but it comes with long-running job management facilities, which I think is great, you know. Um, beautiful tool. We've got an open source orchestration framework that's got pluggable drivers, pluggable discovery. None of this stuff existed before either. All of this in the endeavor to uh, uh, get Surf working with our orchestration. I think all of this is pretty good. But most importantly, even more important than all that stuff, we got job orchestration, which is resilient to network failure. And that, that's the big deal for us. That's the chicken. You know, we got that chicken. That's what we set out to do, and we got it. And we got it using Surf. A lot of you might think, really? Like, you did all that? All that work simply so that you could dispatch a job reliably when one network link is down. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Resiliency is important to us. It's pager dude. It's just got to run, you know? Um, but also, it's, it's kind of cool, too. <laughs> it's pretty cool stuff. I, at least I think that it is. And, and uh, I also kind of just wanted to leave you guys with a, a couple links here. Uh, these are links to the two projects that were a result of our works in, in doing infrastructure orchestration using uh, Surf. So it's the open source project Blender, open source Ruby library SurfX, which provides all of the job management libraries I've been talking about during here. And um, I would very highly encourage you guys to go check it out, see what you think. Um, we'd love to hear feedback, pull request welcome. Thank you guys for listening to what I have to say and open for questions. Uh, initially, you described a situation where you were manually doing um, steps to whatever, that something crashed on one end and you can't SSH into it anymore. So that isn't an unknown state. How does this solve that unknown state where if a job fails partway through, um, it, it fixes if network goes down and you can get around it, but if, if that job actually fails, like you still have that state that's an error, right? That's a very good question. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is a really hard problem in job orchestration, uh, recovering from, from failure. Uh, I, th I think that I've, att I've attempted to do this. Successful might be a strong word, but um, it, it's really hard to do, in fact, and as I'm sure you're aware, and you asked this question. Um, yeah, we don't really solve that problem, but what we do do is we can, with, using Surf as the command dispatch system, we can say, well, the chances that that thing is going to fail due to a transport error are much, much lower now. So if it does fail, it's likely due to a failure, an actual failure on the remote system, as opposed to, oh, some router took a shit on my path, right? Um, which is the failure that we more commonly see. I think that what the, the, the issues that you're bringing, they still very much exist. And you kind of, unfortunately, you kind of have to proceed with those on a case-by-case -case basis, um, because recovery from an orchestration event, uh, orchestration failure, sorry, is, um, is, is very tuned to what you're trying to do, you know. Does that, yeah. <coughs> is there also a, an idea of like checksumming a job when it comes in so that if, if it's an exec command that gets cut off halfway through, if I'm like pushing a script to it where a network dies halfway through, that that's not an inconsistent state or um, also like post job runs to check a state where a file should be in place after this job runs and I could say, hey, everything got it, everything it said, exit zero, but like, is that file actually there? Like, I don't know. Is, is there anything like that in Blender? Okay, so two questions. One, uh, check summing and, and job uh, dispatch reliability, I would assume, and two, uh, follow up sanity checks. Um, so the first bit, uh, that, that a lot of that stuff, check summing is taken care of for us in the protocols. UDP is check summed and we're single packet uh, with surf. And so those things are kind of abstracted away for us. We can assume reliably, I think and hope, uh, that the message will get to the surf daemon intact. If the surf daemon is processing your handler, probably means that the message was received in its entirety. Now, uh, I'm sorry, the second was... Uh, uh, like the, the, post sorry. job yeah. checks. Uh, so, so those checks can, uh, so I, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll roll right back to here. Um, so, uh, when start, when kill, when pull, I cut that part off. There's a pull command, you can issue any other 
if you like. But the idea here is that because it's raw Ruby, um, when you receive the pull event or query uh, in the async job handler, you can do any raw Ruby check that you like. You can read a file, you can say this thing is there, or this thing is not fail. Oh, the pull, this thing didn't work, right? Um, so all of that logic can kind of be embedded into the handler or dependent libraries, if you will. Um, that's kind of actually, uh, in my opinion, the power of this whole uh, you know, Ruby-based DSL is that you can just write raw Ruby if you want to. So I don't know if you guys are Ruby shop or not. Hopefully you are. Um, but this, you can certainly stuff that code in here, some helper methods or something like that. Does that make sense for you? Yeah. So you've mentioned that Surf gives you the capability to sort of route around network issues, um, but can you give me a sense of how much data is actually flowing through there at any given time? Like, you know, if you're taking a look at your clusters, is, is there like, you know, lots of Surf traffic, a little bit? Is it mainly these kinds of, uh, in, you know, say infrequent events, or are you using this a lot? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, we. <laughs> I can, I can detect where this question is going. Yeah, surf, surf is generally low throughput and doesn't allow for a whole lot of events to be occurring. Um, so certainly this scheme might, might dictate the upper limit of what you can do in terms of a, of a single surf cluster and a number of nodes. Um, but because a lot, some of, half of the stuff we're doing doesn't require polling, half the stuff does. Um, but these jobs are kind of usually run in singleton, so it's not like we have like a trillion Cassandra pairs running all in unison and then and then polling for the status of, the, of those jobs. But um, it, usually we say like, okay, repair this cluster. Or, okay, now we're going to repair this cluster, or now we're going to repair this cluster. So um, the, our usage patterns don't really generate a whole lot of surf traffic, and so those problems we we tend not to see them, though. I can certainly imagine that there are abuses of this, of this stuff that will lead to a saturation of the surf and gossip network, if you will. But um, yeah, we, we haven't seen that yet, and, and we are very conscious on what generates cluster-wide events and how we direct those and things like that. And uh, as maybe as a follow-up question, um, how much of the sort of state of the system is sort of in the gossip layer versus is in I don't know if Blender runs as like a web app or a service, um, is in the coordination layer. Um, so we maintain no state in gossip. And uh, Blender, Blender is simply script driven. So I on my workstation will invoke a Blender script. I'll use Blender to read the script and execute it. Um, all of the state is maintained uh, server side, I guess it would be called. Um, when it, I, I had a snippet up there. When async job is fired, you specify a state file. And, that, and the state of that job is maintained by a parent process, and it, and it pulls and writes that state into a file. And only that state is emitted when you query for it. So I'll say, what is the state of this job on this node? And uh, that node will read the state file with the, uh, via the handler and will return the state of the current process. We'll return process ID if it's still running, or we'll return an exit code if it's done, stuff like that. So um, all of the state is kind of shoved down onto disk and into individual nodes, and we're very, very lightweight in, in terms of what we put into uh, Surf itself. Does that answer your question? Awesome. All right, so if there are no more questions, thank you, Evan. Thank you.